Hi, I'm Conrad Marshall, and from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, this is Good Weekend Talks, a magazine for your ears in which we take a deep dive into the definitive stories of the day. Every week you can download new episodes in which top journalists from across our newsrooms host conversations with the people capturing the imagination of Australians right now. On today's episode, we speak to broadcaster Miff Warhurst about her eclectic career in radio and TV, including the music knowledge that made her both a Eurovision commentator and a Spicks and Specs favourite, as well as her current stage role playing the narrator in a new production of The Rocky Horror Show. Not to mention a recurring gig on the animated global hit Bluey, In a wide-ranging chat, Miff also talks about being a foster parent and menopause. And hosting this conversation is someone who once wrote a love letter to Warhurst's infectious giggle, including these words. The effervescent sound rises like freshly popped champagne and makes us feel good. And by us, I mean the socially isolated, slightly lonely people listening to ABC Radio in the middle of the day. We need a little love, you know? That person, in need of a little love, is none other than Good Weekend senior writer, Melissa Fife. Thanks, Conrad. And welcome, Miff. Lovely to be here. <laughs> Lovely to see you too. <laughs> Lovely to see now. you again. In the intro, Conrad mentioned the little review that I did of your radio program. How long did you do that? There was an ABC National program, wasn't it? It was. I did that for two years. I'm trying to think when that was now. Um, post, Post-COVID post and lockdowns, it's like time doesn't exist anymore. But I think it was 2017 to 19. And um, yeah, it was a daily arts and culture program on the ABC on local radio. And I, I love doing that show. I had a beautiful team and we had, a, we had a great time and I got to do some really interesting stuff. And you wrote the most beautiful review of it. It was like, oh, God. Gosh, this is gorgeous. Thank you. And 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 it's funny because when you do radio every day and you put it out there, there's always a lot of feedback from everybody, but you rarely get that concrete feedback from someone saying it I'm listening and it it's meaningful to me. You yeah. know? What was really beautiful about it, I think, was that particularly I loved your interviews with musicians. And I feel like this is going to get me cancelled or something, but I, I've always felt that musicians are really hard to interview mm. and that of all the arts, I find that they don't have a lot to say, but you, you just manage to, I don't know, you just seem to really get a lot out of them. I think you you actually are quite right about that, Mel. They are a lot of musicians, not all, obviously, um, and I I do think some are extraordinary talkers about their their craft and the art of making music. But I think for a lot of musicians, that they just want to put their music out there, and that that yeah. feels like enough. And then to have to do more on top of that almost feels like an imposition. I think for yes. for some musicians because they've already bared their souls yeah. in so many ways. And I I think I always understood it. From from that perspective that they didn't probably really want to have to do all the extra stuff <laughs> and have a chat. So, I, I, I mean, you know, and, and you'd know you're, you're a great interviewer as well. You go for the the angle that uh, maybe something that, that might not be directly related to the music but would get back to it somehow. And right. that was always a nice way, to, nice way to have a conversation because I think too, you know, after they've spent – years or what, however long making an album or creating what they create, it's almost like the last thing they want to do is talk about it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. I love that about the show. I mean, you know, I've been thinking about the music business, which you, you've just seen so much change, haven't you? Mm. Like I remember when I first met you, you were a freelance writer for EG. That's right. And some very brave editor, uh, Michael Gawenda put me in charge of it. <laughs> you were the editor and it was amazing. Let's think about that. That was the 90s and, yeah. and we were, you know, you were running the show. That's right. I, don't know. I, no, I had no idea what I was doing. Oh, you and, did. And, and you were like, come, you came out of street press with your degree in what was it exactly? Uh, I had I, I did a, an honours in fine art, so fine my arts, my, yeah. my sort of background was more 
visual arts and architecture and art history. But um, I'd started out doing music, and and I'm That's a, right. I'm a failed um, failed musician. My brothers are great <laughs> musicians. When you know, when you see people that have actually got it or got the what it, yeah. it, it takes, I think you, you realise it was probably the right thing that I I dipped out, but found music in another way. Um, and then yeah, I did a post grade in art curatorial studies, which I've never used except for once. Oh no, I did use it once. I did one exhibition yeah. for the National Trust, and you're going to love this one. It was on the history of public toilets in Melbourne. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear all about it. Oh my god! I, and this was years ago because I got to go through the archives and find all the original designs of the public toilets, which were all beautifully drawn, as you can imagine. Oh my god. They are they look like artworks in yeah. themselves, but it was around the time of um, Flinders Street Station and those beautiful plans that were drawn up. And the underground toilets were really quite pivotal in changing what Melbourne was as a city because, oh. for the first time, women had a place. To go to the toilet. Oh, so they could go out to for they a could, day. They could the, have a day in the city. Yes, and they didn't have to just be in a shop that would cater. And I'd say there would be rare, rare few shops that would cater for yeah. women because previously there were no public toilets. That's right. So it's actually the installation of public toilets in Melbourne changed the nature of the city, wow. which I think is just magnificent. Mm. And so you used your curating kind of skills just for that one thing. One thing. And then you went on this totally different thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, I was always going to come back to music, I think, because, yeah. I, I, like I said, I was a failed pianist. Um, I, I studied up to university. I did my first year and then realised I wasn't quite up to scratch. I mean, I was surrounded by people that had done, you know, a couple of years of jazz improv before yeah. they got into the course and they were just, you know, they, yeah. they've, they've got it and I didn't. I was like, what am I doing here? I think I got in on the country quota, but that's okay. <laughs> I <laughs> I moved over, but I've always loved it and it was my, when I was a kid, my connection to the wide world because we grew up pre-internet for anyone yeah. anyone who's listening who didn't experience the horror. <laughs> <laughs> Like the Ice Age. It was. It feels like the Ice Age now, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and really the only way you could get a window on the world was magazines and and music and, and books and certainly in terms of finding a community as well. That was quite quite difficult too if you're in a – I was in a small country town, yes, you know. Yeah. So I just I – just, I think that's why I obsessed over it and I knew I'd always come back and when I came to Melbourne and I – Start, was studying. I started writing at local street press, which now doesn't exist anymore, of course. Yeah. Which was a free newspaper you'd get every Wednesday. Yes. And oh, you wait love religiously <laughs> for the gig guys. The gigs. What's on? Where am I going to exactly. go? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it feels like such an innocent time now, doesn't it? it does. When you look back, it feels so ancient as well. Absolutely. But what do you think of where the music industry is at now? Like, it's just. Do you think it's easier for young? people to get a go in the music, mm. or young talent or harder or just the same? To be honest, I don't feel like I can probably answer this with any kind of expertise about whether or not it's easier or harder for younger musicians. What I do like about it now is that I think it's a lot more open in terms of the types of people that can get into Excellent. music. Yep, and yep. that that to me is a huge change in, in the music industry. As you know, it was pretty male-dominated. It was so blokey. Uh, back when we were in the throes of it. And I also think too, I didn't really even think twice about that. I didn't either. At the time. Yeah. And, and it's really interesting to look back now and go, oh, my goodness, that was – that was so normalised. Yes. There were very, very, very few women. Mm -hmm. And I think as I've gotten older, I've had to question my own, I, I guess you'd call it ingrained misogyny, yeah. you know, yeah. because I grew up yeah. listening and, and thinking that all these men who made music were the pinnacle and you think about the canon of, you know, 50 greatest albums, yes. 50 greatest artists. For a long time they were also only men with a couple of women. So you kind of grow up with that in your head. Yeah. And, and now I, I look back and go, oh, goodness, I was probably more judgmental of women who are making music than I should have been or might have been. I don't know. I don't think I was. I mean, I loved all music. Oh, yeah. But I think now I see it. It was, it was just so male dominated. I didn't even notice. Yeah, and and I think that's a wonderful change. Yeah, what surprises you about the current entertainment scene? Like I was listening to your podcast the other day, Bang On, and you and Sanro were talking about the White Lotus, the talk in Sydney at I think it was Vivid Festival, where with Mike White, who's the creator and writer of of White Lotus. 
and Jennifer Coolidge. And that had 8,000 people come. Is that right? To to a talk. To a talk. Yeah, 8,000 people. It says so much, doesn't it, about where we're at culturally and, and, and what matters. I think we're at White Lotus Connected significantly because that first season was in, I know I was in lockdown. Yes, and, yes. And, oh, I loved it then because it was the holiday that you, even though it was a horrible murder that happened, <laughs> it was a holiday that we couldn't go on. And <laughs> I know, it, it was so good. <laughs> it was so good and it, for some reason it just captured everyone's imaginations, including mine. And to see the the renaissance of Jennifer Coolidge as well in her, in her 60s. Yes. Um, such an amazing actor herself, it's just been wonderful to watch and I love the advice that she gave. She said if you feel bad or feel like you can't put yourself out there, just go and go and look at really terrible things <laughs> and just know that you can give it a go and, and I take inspiration <laughs> from that because, you know, I've made lots of terrible <laughs> things and you kind of have to. And if you if you don't, you know, if you don't give it a go, you won't you won't know. Yeah. And also, you know, it's great to see these women owning it at this age as well. It gives me hope. Absolutely. It gives me hope because, you know, I haven't made it yet. I don't know what that means, but, you know. <laughs> I think you if have. I'm living like If I'm living like Jennifer Coolidge in my 60s, I'll be pretty pleased. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> She's living her best life. But speaking of you, if you're like on the Rocky Horror Show and currently in Melbourne mm. as the narrator. Yes. <laughs> so what's that like, like being part of a stage show? Well, I've never done it before and, you know, I'm not going to say I'm the best at it or anything. I'm certainly, I, I wasn't employed for my acting skills. I call it actoring is what I'm doing. <laughs> my, my role is to, to tell the story but also bring my own self to it. And, um, you know, I think for a couple of people it's a little bit jarring because it's always played traditionally by an old old, more sort yes. of, you know, a so distinguished gentleman distinguished, yes, yeah. with a lot more gravitas. And I, and I think, <laughs> and, and I have none of that. So, you know, I look, I'm fine with that. It doesn't, it doesn't please everybody, but it's, it's just been such an extraordinary experience. And I would never have known if I'd lived in fear of, you know, people going, you know, you can't, you shouldn't do that. Um, i.e. Jennifer Coolidge, just go and do it. Go and and do it. I've, I've been, you know, get to get to be around young people who, again, it's, I'm 50 this year. Rocky Horror is 50. Can you believe it? Oh like, my God. and it's one of the longest running musicals, which is I, I get it because the music is fantastic and it's it's just bonkers. The whole show is just bonkers and it's fun and to be around people who love music because they're musical theatre performers predominantly who are, you know, they've got their lives in front of them. It's just so energising. Like I just, I'm, I'm, I've adored being around them, you know. And Jason Donovan plays the lead role of Frank and Furter and it's just hilarious. Like if I could have told little 15-year-old me oh, in the in the country yeah. who was, you know, I loved Jason and Kylie. Oh, yeah. Well, did you, I had a tape of their song. Oh, I can't remember what oh, it was called now. Especially for you. Especially sang, for I you. I sang it to Jason one <laughs> <laughs> And he was astounded that I knew every word. And I said to him, mate, you don't know. I grew up in the country. We had nothing else to do. I, I was listening to that song in Tasmania. I loved it so yeah, much. I loved it so much. Did, did he Did he kind of go, oh, God, I can't believe I did that? <laughs> I think, you know, I think it, it would be difficult for someone like Jason who had such a pop career, yeah, you know, such a, a hugely successful to career, like superstar status. Yeah. Yeah. Um, It'd be, I think it'd be difficult for him to look back at, at that stuff and have a gauge on what that time was like because it must have been, I mean, he was, a, he was a, essentially a teenager when that all went yeah. down as well. Yeah. I don't know what that must have been like because I didn't get any kind of recognition until I was well into my 30s in terms of like public yeah. acknowledgement or whatever. Um, I don't know how you would have dealt with that at... 18 yeah. or whatever that was, yeah. um, I'm, I was an idiot and I was still an idiot in <laughs> at 35. But, <laughs> but you know, like it's, uh, yeah, it just must have been such a wild time for him. Yeah. So you mentioned that you've just turned 50. Mm. Any reflections upon that? Oh, goodness me. Um, well, <laughs> I, had, I turned 50 and a week later I had a fall in the bathroom and <laughs> in my knee so it's all over. <laughs> no, um, I don't know. It's I, I think a lot of people dread 50 but I certainly haven't been. I think because I've been doing this beautiful production with a bunch of young folk, it's 
I, I don't know. I feel like I need to go into the next fifty with the same enthusiasm that they have, you know, or that or that I came into the first fifty with. There's otherwise, why are we why are we doing it? You know, mm. um, this life that we have. So that's my reflection on it. I just want to. I just want to have. I haven't got the energy. Let's be honest. I'm old and tired now, and that's fine. But I I don't want to lose that enthusiasm for for life and 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 the the things around me and and the joy you know yeah. and and I've just been having such a great like it's literally just fun doing this this show and, and really when you when you go home at night and you've had a great laugh and you've you've mucked around and had a bit of a dance and it, it's it's not rocket science or anything <laughs> like that but gee it it feels good and and mm. I think yeah, I just I just want to take that sort of energy into the next next fifty as long as I can, and I can and I still got my, you know, <laughs> my, my mobility and and all of that. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, you know. But that's that's the other thing too. We we've lost a lot of people along the way when you get to fifty already, yeah, and yeah, yeah. the fact that I do have my health and I you know and I've I have worked on my mental health, which I think is really important, and I have worked on you know. I'm not super physical, physically fit, let's be honest, um, but I'd like to. You're getting there. Yeah. <laughs> You've I'd, started on the you journey. Know, yeah, I've started on that journey. Um, but, yeah, it's just, yeah, I think it, it's, a, it's a privilege now. Uh, anything past this is a privilege and, and you know, there's, there's people who aren't here that should still be here and I feel like if we're living it, we live it for them too. We'll be back in a moment. But in the meantime, reviews help people find us. So if you like what we're doing, it'd be great if you could help us out. Just jump on your podcast app and give us a rating to spread the word and let us know what you love. Last year, you also did a documentary, a mini documentary on on menopause. Mm. What was the reaction that you had to to that? Oh, my goodness. that I've had... Of all the things I've done, and I've done a quite a, you know, a, a, a lot of different kinds of things, that's probably the one I've had the most reaction to. Like women literally stopping me in dressing rooms going, I loved that documentary that you made. Thank you for making it. And I think I did it for the reasons that I didn't know anything about menopause, nothing, and my... I didn't talk about it with my mum. It's not – it was all very hush-hush, yep. you know. All of that stuff I think is is so – for our generation. Unspoken. So unspoken. Mm. And and then all of a sudden, you know, all my friends are sort of talking about these things that they're experiencing yeah. and, and some of us don't even know that that could be attributed to – menopause. There's so much we don't know because no one ever told us anything yeah. about it. And so I went into it and, you know, and I've never been one to talk about that stuff much. I'm actually quite a, quite inhibited in, in, in yeah. that way. And I thought, well, look, if that's me and I don't know anything and it makes me uncomfortable, then there's got to be so many other people that feel the same way. So I, I felt I felt almost compelled to do it. And I'd just done a documentary through Catalyst at the ABC, oh, yep. Keep On Dancing, which was about oh, right, how yes. dance yep. um, can change the, the neural pathways of your brain exactly, and, yep. and can help in terms of, you know, just overall health and wellbeing. And, and, and I loved working with them. I loved doing stuff that I guess it wasn't really necessarily about me. Yeah. You know, yep. and I think as you get older, you, oh, I'm sick of me. Um, <laughs> but it's also very practical, you know. And when yep. you do science documentaries, they're very practical. And, they're and helpful. That, they're helpful. Yeah. And my reflection on turning 50, I want to make things that either help people or make them feel good or, or yeah. make them laugh or, or feel entertained or feel like part of something. And I think the menopause one was why I said yes to that. It's like this can help some people mm. and I hope it has and I feel like it has because, like I said, literally a, a woman stopped me in a change room. In, <laughs> <laughs> She's thinking yeah. you get out of my change room. And it's one of those <laughs> ones where you have to, um, there's no mirror in your room so oh, you have to go oh, out. I and ones. I looked terrible and I was like, she goes, oh, I loved your menopause doctor. And I was like, oh, oh that's so sweet. <laughs> I said, please don't judge me. This looks terrible on me right now. <laughs> but I had to come out and have a look. But, yeah, it's it's, um, it's it's been really good, and I think to the younger gen, they're so good now at, especially younger women, yeah, at talking about all that stuff. And we were, yep. we, there was so much shame for our generation, Absolutely. I think, and I think there yeah. still is, and it's it's a waste of time. 
yes. essentially. It's all that good. shame that we carry and that embarrassment and yeah. because no one ever talked about it. It's all very hush-hush, you know, um, reading Judy Bloom on the Oval. <laughs> are you there? Hello, are you there, God? It's me, it's me Margaret, Margaret. <laughs> which is out on film too now, which oh, I'm, wow. I'm dying to see. But, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, we used to read that in hushed tones like it was, yeah, I just, all, once you lose all that, I think you can spend your time on Better real, things, yeah. It's you know? liberating. It is a bit, and yeah. and yeah, it's it's been nice to feel a bit more liberated, I guess, about all that stuff as I've as I've gotten older. Because you know, like I've never I've never liked. I, I certainly don't. You know, I don't get into all that attention on how you look and your body and that sort of stuff that the media can obsess yeah. over. I've never yeah. invited that, so it was weird to take it down that path. Yeah, to do something so personal, but also I hope it helped some people, and I think it did. Yeah, I mean, I was devastated when that one of the doctors told you that you had to give up cheese and oh. alcohol. I thought that's just too much. <laughs> Ridiculous and spicy food. I mean, spicy ha- food. I, I disagree. I'm not a doctor. So have you done that, though, Viv? No. Have you, no. <laughs> I'm not a doctor, but I can't see how spicy food's going to really hurt. I'm, I mean, I, no, they know what they're doing. They know what they're saying. It's just me. It's very hard to give up the things you love. Yeah, and then, and then another doctor made you walk up a sand dune. Oh, that was ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> she was amazing and the footage looked great. But it yeah, did look beautiful. We were like, I was, we were making that and we spent all day out at... Um, was it in Gippsland? Yeah, or? it was in Gippsland. Um, yeah, I, what's it called? Um, I, I was trying to work Wilson's out. Prom. Wilson's Prom. Wilson's uh, Prom, yes. See, it looked so beautiful. It was incredible. It looked amazing. But, like, I was like, you've got to perimenopausal woman going up and down sand dunes in an effort, hours and hours in the midday sun. What were you thinking? <laughs> what were you thinking? <laughs> you were like, I need a drink and some cheese. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, it was great. So is it last year that you – decided to become a foster parent? Well, it was a couple of years before that actually because I was sort of shuffling around the house on my own because at that point I didn't have a partner and, and I had quite a bit of space and um, and I was just thinking, gosh, there's, you know, I've got I've got three animals that would love the company and I I would love to help in some way if I can. I don't have children. I'm a I'm an auntie, but I don't have my own kids. Mm. And and I just thought, well, I'm sure they probably just need help at this point because I I, I know that during COVID um services were really stretched yeah. when it came to to that sort of stuff. And I had um, a, a girlfriend of mine, she she is a uh, what's known as a kinship carer for right. an organisation called VACA. So she, every week she, she takes um, a little girl for a couple of days a week to give the other foster parents a break. Right, I see, yeah. There's loads of foster care organisations and they're all crying out for people. And you do some training and then once you've done your training, uh, then you have to do a certain amount of uh, emergency cares before you can become a fully-fledged foster carer. And so I, yeah, started to do some emergency cares and, and now fully-fledged. But sadly, I because I then moved out to sort of outer suburbia to a house that's a bit of a shack um, that needs quite a bit of renovation. I haven't been able to take on any kids for a while to help out. But when you, when, you know, when they turn up to your house and, you know, I don't have all the skills and you don't need all the skills. They yeah. just need to feel safe, Yeah, you know, because you don't know what they've come from. They've been brought in by someone they hardly know, you know, just – and these kids are so, so resilient and that's not necessarily a good thing. It's because they have to be, Yeah, you know. They just yeah. have to be and it's – I don't know. It's – there's such a need for if anyone's got any space in their lives, like it's – when you see the kids yeah. and how much they just need to feel safe for that little bit of time, even if it's that, if that's all you can offer. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, I'm sure there's more permanent options for me down the track or ongoing or long term, but I haven't, yeah. I can't do anything like that at the moment because of the house. But yeah, it, it's a really special thing to be able to do to help in that way for little kids that just need it at that time. And are they little enough to appreciate that? That your um, aunt Trixie from from Bluey. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I don't think so. We, I, 
the, I think the person that was I, I've I've had teenagers as well, like oh, wow. fourteen year olds, and I think that was they were more impressed by that oh. than, than the little ones. Oh. Um, the little ones are like yeah, whatever, because you know it's a cartoon, so they yeah. And and Aunt Trixie's in it a bit, but probably not enough for them to know it know her. Oh, as she's a, not a regular. As a, she is yeah. regular. Like I'm in every season, but she's not like you know. Every, every, every episode. episode. She only comes in. I think I'm pretty typecast, which I'm quite happy about. Um, she takes mum away for for drinks. Yes, she's the yeah, nights yeah, out. Girls nights, nights out. out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also I think my character <laughs> eats too much. She eats because. a lot of chips, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Says the girl who ate a box of barbecue shapes instead of dinner yesterday <laughs> on the way into the theatre because I was a bit stretched for time. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm sure they've got all, you know, Representative of all food, five food groups That's right. in, in the in the pizza in the shapes. and shapes. Yeah, pizza yeah. And shapes. <laughs> yeah, I mean the bluey the bluey thing is it's funny that you mentioned that because I did a story on Joe Brum, the writer and creator of Bluey, and it was so hard to get him over the line. Like to he would not. He was sort of like a. He's a bit. He's quite. He's very protective of his public. Mm. Persona, which is totally fair enough. He did not want me to do a profile. I had to keep sort of pestering him over time. And eventually I said, look, you know, because I knew that he had done a lot of reading into child development, yeah. particularly in play. And you can see that in Bluey. You can it's see all, all about play. It. Yeah. And so I said to him, what if we do a piece about that, about about the importance of play and what that means for child children's development? And eventually he said he said no, and then and then I almost cried. He said yes, and so then I ended up going flying to Brisbane to to interview him and going to the Bluey Studios and seeing them, you know, draw it, and it was just it was one of the most exciting moments oh, of my career. Well, see, so I that, haven't even done that because every time I, are you remote, you're sort of remote. I'm remote. I do my voice spits down here in Melbourne. Yeah, yeah, and and so we do it over Skype and in in a studio. So I've never been into the studio, so wow. I'll have to. I'll have to go in there. Yeah, um, yeah. They're just a lovely bunch. Yeah, and I think you're right. It's that they are very protective of it. Yeah, because it's it's. I think it comes from the heart. Yeah. Um, and it's like anything you make that's creative. It, once you put it out there, it's it's open slather, really. Absolutely. And, and because it's so loved, it it could also probably you know easily be critiqued, as we've seen a couple of times, very very quickly. And it's like, guys, it's a kid show. It's a kid show. It's going to be okay. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, they're they're a beautiful bunch. It's mm. it's been really lovely to be a part of that. And like I said, I barely ha- have interacted on a one on one level. I did a, a one of their earlier animations years and years ago. They used oh. to hear me on Triple J. So right. um, yeah, yeah, a friend of a friend uh, said they knew me, and that's how, and I've I've voiced that animation. And and then um, I think the the role of I, I think I tried out for the role of the mum. Oh wow! But because I sound like Patty and Selma from the The Simpsons, <laughs> I I always have. Um, I think I sounded a bit too grown up, or mm. not not grown up, but you know, a bit too, a bit too husky, or maybe a bit more like sort of grandma kind yeah, of. Yeah, exactly, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, they they wrote they wrote Trixie in for me. Oh wow, I they think, did that I for think, you. I think that's what I remember. But that was yeah. that was quite a few years ago now. So it's yeah. been it's been going for quite a few years. But I wish them every success. Well, they're doing amazingly well yeah. internationally. Yeah, I mean, I ended up ended up coming home and like saying to my my two girls, like, I have been. I like, guess where I've been today? I have been at the Bluey Studio, <laughs> and they were like, "Whatever, mum." Oh, <laughs> that's so cute. They could I, maybe it was though that they couldn't conceptualise. To them, it is a cartoon. So yeah, it's a fully formed. It's a world. real thing for them. Yeah. So perhaps I was just destroying their dreams when I said that. Yeah, they're like, we don't want to know the nuts and bolts, man. We just want to watch the show. We love the show. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's gorgeous. I did have one little kid lose his mind at a at a wedding I was at. Just oh wow, because his mum told him that I was the voice of Aunt Trixie. I'm not sure if he'd really put two and two together. I think he just heard Bluey and and that was it. He just stared at me for a long time, and that was pretty cute. And was it last year that you you did a book memoir? A memoir? Yes. How was that? Um. It was amazing. Like I, I, I hated writing it. Of course, yeah. everyone hates writing them. Yeah. Um, but in a way, I think it was really, I don't know. It was a really, again, a nice way to cap off that fifty and start yep. start the new one. Yeah. Uh, it was, yeah. It's very cathartic. 
it's joyful to think back and remember. But the hardest thing is to write about, I found, write about people that you know and love. Oh, it's really hard. Yeah, because that's, your interpretation is not their interpretation. (laughs) And so the story, you don't need, and memory is a, you know, strange, malleable thing. Everyone's memories of events are very different. So I I found that part of it really difficult. I did because you know, you don't wanna you don't wanna write something that doesn't feel good for another person. So yeah. it's, I think I, I I was very mindful of that. Uh so yeah, it, it, it was it was quite difficult in that sense. But yeah, really enjoyed it and, and just doing it was quite I was quite proud, you know. Mm. Like it's it's not gonna win awards or anything, but it was I, I don't know, I've written a book, like, yeah. whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so what's next for you, Miff? What's on the Miff horizon? I don't know. I genuinely don't know. Um, is, that, is that kind of been your, your career is like you're doing the ABC thing and then that mm. stopped and then like you don't, is that the case? Yeah. You don't really know. You don't really know. And and I think that's been one thing I've learnt as, I, as I've gotten older is to be less anxious about not knowing. Yeah. Because something usually comes up yep. and whether I drive it, i.e. writing the book or whether someone else comes up with an idea yep. or I come up with an idea for something, I feel like there'll be something brewing. I, I, I got a little a little place sort of out in the outer suburbs of Melbourne and, and I'm pretty keen on on architecture and um, this little house is a, a – it's a shack. Like, it was, <laughs> let's be honest, it's a real shack um, and it needs a lot of work. But there, there's a bit of that. It's a, it's a Robin Boyd house. Oh, wow. And that to me is I, – I never thought in my wildest dreams I'd ever have one. I mean, I don't own it. The bank owns it. But, <laughs> yeah. but it's – I want to bring that back to life and I want to I want to be able to share that with people too. I feel like a, I'm a bit of a custodian of it because yeah. it's one of one of his earliest and um yeah it's rough as guts. So you need to renovate it according to his original kind of vision or Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so bring it back to its original yeah. state. Um I've always loved his architecture I, for some reason like we grew up my my folks were pretty hilarious really now that I think about it. It was in the seventies up in near Muldura. We lived in a tram. They they a tram? they bought a W class tram from the Melbourne City Council for five hundred bucks or something in nineteen seventy eight. Wow. Chucked it on the back of a truck and shipped it up there. Can you imagine like most people in Muldura hadn't hadn't even seen a tram at this point if they hadn't been to Melbourne. And um <laughs> and so they converted that and then we built a mud brick house um where we mm. made the bricks. And mum and dad are very, you know, they were, dad was a school principal mum mm. and teacher. They were both artists though, but you know, certainly not hippies by any stretch. But here we are making mud bricks, all the kids, and we built this mud brick house and that's an Alistair Knox house. And if you live in Melbourne, he designed a lot of the mud brick houses in around the Eltham area. Yeah. And 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 so I, I guess I grew up always loving the idea of how we live and how much the home can have an impact on on, you know, who you are or who you become or um yeah, just ways of living, I think, you know, and we, we have the luxury of that here uh, in this country. A lot of us have had. If if there's thought and care put into good design, it, I think it really helps. Yeah. And um, I'm really into that. So I just want to preserve this little little shack and, <laughs> and hopefully other people can enjoy it down the track too. Give it another 50 years, like I'll give myself another 50 years. <laughs> I hope. Well, I hope you have another... <laughs> Another 50 years, Niv. Um, I hope so too, but, you know, you never know. So You never know. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming in today. It's been such a pleasure talking to you, Miff. So. Oh, Mel, always <laughs> a pleasure. And it's amazing how small the world is and, and, mm. and I'm really finding it's all coming back to, to where we started at this at this point in my life and, and like, seeing you again. Gosh, we were so young and, and just full of, full of life. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think, I don't think that's changed. No. That much. It's just we're just a bit different, but we're still the same. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, hopefully we'll carry that on into the next 50 yeah. years. Yeah. Thanks, Miv. Thank you so much. Good Weekend Talks is brought to you by the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Subscriptions power our newsrooms. To support independent journalism, search subscribe Sydney Morning Herald or The Age. And if you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe, rate and comment wherever you get your podcasts. This episode of Good Weekend Talks is produced by Chi Wong. Technical assistance from Cormac Lally. Editing from Conrad Marshall. Tom McKendrick is head of audio. And Katrina Strickland is the editor of Good Weekend. Good Weekend.